Hey, hey, it's Dr. Mitch. I'm back. We're going to pick up on hallucinogens three here with Amanita muscaria. If this mushroom looks familiar to you, maybe you play uh, a video game with Mario in the title. Uh, truth be told, this is the fly agaric mushroom, Amanita muscaria. It's well known in the northern hemisphere and probably one of the world's oldest intoxicants. As I mentioned, so it's intriguing because it's uh, because it's so north, uh, up in the colder areas of what is now Scandinavia. Uh, there were some hypotheses that maybe the Vikings took these before they went on their big raids. Uh, I'm not particularly impressed with those data. It was probably uh, a form of headbane, and then our new data suggesting they drink mercury, which must have been toxic and insane. But the bottom line is you know it's not the regular psilocybin mushrooms and that it works in the cholinergic system. So a number of di different hexing drugs and witchcraft uh, essentially relied upon these kinds of drugs. So they are anticholinergic, right? They're going to block some of choline's effects. So this parasympathetic system is getting blocked so now, essentially, arousal is going to increase. You do get reductions in mucus in the nose, which I could certainly use right now. Uh, so body temperature ends up elevated, but not because sympathetic is up so much as parasympathetic is down. Heart rate and blood pressure go up, and the pupils are dilated, as we saw with uh, LSD as well. The recipes for this, so uh, George Rebeck in Indiana basically found like these old witches brew type recipes and they all relied on fungi that have these chemicals. And really the creation of a delirium or confusion and loss of memory, perhaps the sense that witches are flying on brooms uh, was that that was their subjective experience after ingesting these and you could administer them through the mucous membranes because these would taste dreadful. So maybe putting it on a broom and sitting on it, if you have a mucous membrane uh, between your legs, that would be the form of absorption. The principal drugs are atropine, as we talked about, belladonna, scopolamine, and hyoscyamine. Basically, if you know that these are uh, cholinergic drugs, you'll know what's going on and that these might have been the source of some of the wild uh, experiences of flying, maybe supported, reported by, by witches back in the, in the day. I, uh, I got to tell the weird tale because it's going to come up, but Amanita muscaria is uh, often accompanied by other molecules in the mushroom that are really super nauseating. And if the mushroom itself is digested first, the urine of that person or animal will then keep the psychoactive parts, but not the nauseating parts. Well, fewer of them. So this uh, idea that they were chasing reindeer around after feeding them to them and getting their pee and drinking it, which I thought has to be too gross to possibly be true. I'm afraid it probably is. And uh, at least depending upon which source you ask, obviously they're not doing the empirical work, but from a human, that would also be the case. And I just, the whole drinking urine thing makes me want to vomit, so never mind. PCP, I'm not going to hit hard. This was a serious problem in the 80s when I lived in Missouri, but this is a synthetic depressant. We think of it as a dissociative anesthetic, basically, and this was angel dust. This was often added to cannabis joints and just creates an absurd amount of uh, sedation, but it also does have surgical effects. So folks will inadvertently, you know, put a hand through a window and not feel it and it ends up uh, creating this illusion that they have super strength or something like that. It's really, it's just not, ugh, not a drug you want to have anything to do with. Weird combination of stimulant depressant and hallucinogenic. It's basically as the ascending limb, uh, as the, you know, the blood drug curve is such that the drug is getting more and more concentrated, you sort of see the stimulation. And then sedation on the way down. Alcohol does the same thing, really. Uh, and the hallucinogenic qualities, it's more the dissociative out of my body than the mystical at oneness business. So uh, 
seems to only have clinical utility as an anesthetic. The patterns of PC abuse, again, uh, it could be orally administered, IV, or inhaled, but commonly smoked alone or with other drugs. Truth be told, it's mixed with tobacco or marijuana, if it's used at all. It really has lost popularity just because the negative consequences are potentially so nuts. So yes, the results are uh, extremely dangerous with unpredictability. The replication of the positive effects seems to be difficult. It's not just set and setting. It may be state of the gut if it's orally administered. Your previous mood, it just, it's just really just too labile to make much sense of. Uh, acute effects tend to be all over the map, though, right? So manic excitement, severe anxiety, but depression, sudden mood changes, confused thought. And I think the confused thought is basically underlying all the rest of it. So they say it's unpredictable aggression. Well, I think if you're super paranoid and you're not reading other people's cues correctly, then, of course, you might get aggressive simply because you think you're being threatened. Uh, just not... Uh, popular anymore. Let's count our blessings. And I'm not going to be hitting this hard on the test. Ketamine, the other dissociative anesthetic, is still used for that very reason and has some intriguing uh, clinical applications that I want to get into. So it really is used as an anesthetic in the emergency room because it doesn't uh, suppress breathing, right? So in the field, basically out at wartime, if you need to have an anesthetic, but you don't want to put somebody out like so out that they might actually stop breathing, this is the anesthetic of choice. Uh, mixture of stimulant and depressive responsive, it's kind of on the ascending limb and descending limb like the other drugs we've mentioned, but it's, it's uh, not an upper or a downer, but an inside outer. It just really doesn't... Uh, relate that way and it's and it's hard to describe it's sort of an ineffable experience like other hallucinogens at higher doses but yes it's great for emergency surgery anesthesia adverse side effects so unpredictable violent jerking and twitching that's only at really high doses of folks who are uninformed or or in pain vivid and unpleasant dreams uh, Never heard an individual case of this, but again, if the set and setting are off, you can imagine it being particularly unpleasant. Hallucinations and disorientation, certainly eyes closed visuals and the subjective floating. Uh, oddly enough, the folks who focus on the I'm outside my body do not have uh, the same experience or as high quality experience as the folks who focus on the oneness. I'm uh, a connected to humanity sort of thing. So the clinical applications essentially have pretty compelling data for depression, PTSD, and pain. It's curious because uh, it, it should be part of another tr treatment program. Like I don't recommend it all on its own for any of these, but if you fail to uh, antidepressants and are in psychotherapy and can take advantage of the potential effects uh, the data on depression are pretty impressive, but, uh, there's a clinic here, Albany Ketamine, that it, they, you know, they just see it as getting up to a therapeutic dose. I obviously don't see it that way. I think it's important to have the insights that will inspire you to behave in ways that are consistent with your values, the PTSD as well. So, uh, we obviously have superb exposure therapy, uh, that I was trained in. My wife does cognitive reprocessing, has really nice outcome data without any medication at all. Uh, dropout rates are pretty high on the exposure, as you might guess, uh, but ketamine-assisted uh, seems to do better, at least than the placebo control. And then pain usually requires a much longer duration administration. It may require, you know, multiple sessions, but those data are uh, coming out relatively positive. Pain is a, a curious ailment and actually has wild placebo responses. So I'm not impressed with the placebos they've used because they don't create as dramatic an experience, but certainly works. And yeah, uh, Albany Ketamine, they, they've got stuff for you. All right, so let's pick up with Salvia Divinorum. Uh, it's intriguing. Uh, Mexican herb that tends to grow down in Oaxaca. The shamans down there uh, have used it as a treatment for 
you know, basically longer than we have any records to confirm one way or another. Generally, the notion was you're going to have the leaves and get them in a big old bundle and um, put them between the, basically, your teeth and your gums. The absorption then would be uh, transdermal through that mucous membrane inside your cheek. So, uh, allegedly, some treatment for rheumatism, headache, diarrhea, and abdominal discomfort. The GI effects certainly at those low doses are detectable. Uh, as an analgesic, I really don't quite understand or know what to say. Um, there just there just aren't any data uh, published. The uh, shamans tend to also, you know, put a big wad in the, between the chicken gum and and then, you know, offer you some interpretations of what's going on for you, listen really well, reflect what you say. It's a little bit like motivational interviewing with somebody who's uh, a little bit tripping. Unfortunately, in America, it's better, stronger, faster. We had to make it into an extract, turn it into 10 times as strong, smoke it, and so end up, you know, having this really dramatic uh, hallucinogen experience. Folks do literally laugh a lot and then end up falling down. Folks are getting hurt. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's just not an educated way. And the lighting it on fire is, according to the shaman, is really disrespectful of the plant. So these intense visual hallucinations, at least eyes closed at high doses, that's the case. A lot of laughter, an out-of-body dissociative experience, again, really only at very high doses. Last less than 15 minutes, obviously, folks redose when it's smoked, which I, you know, ugh. And then currently legal in some states, but not others. And it's not a, you know, it's not an obvious red state, blue state thing. I know Delaware has laws against it. Uh, in Missouri, they, Missouri and Illinois both have it illegal. Uh, last I checked, New York State, it was legal. It's it's just kind of confusing. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. I think the leaves being legal would make perfect sense. These extracts, when it's 10 times as concentrated, might be ill-advised. Uh, yeah, DEA is attempting to schedule one right now. The opiate epidemic is kind of covering up any of those issues and really just uh, overshadowing any other big DEA work right now. Okay, so here's a good sample item. Which of these is cholinergic? Is it scopolamine, salvia, or LSD? And of course, you know that one's scopolamine. And which of these is involved in depression trials? Ayahuasca, atropine, atropine or fly agaric? Yeah, Jordy Reba is doing a trial of ayahuasca with depression and it uh, has a small sample but the initial data look very encouraging uh, atropine the cholinergic one is not really uh, legendary for any antidepressant effects and fly agaric the amanita muscaria is just way too nauseating and nobody wants to uh, have to vomit to have a depression treatment but the ayahuasca trials probably <laughs> aren't working that way so yeah I'm not exactly sure why there's more pursuit of that. I did want to spend just a few seconds on the notion of avoiding a freak out. Obviously, you should never use hallucinogens except in, you know, clinical settings with an MD there because, you know, MDs, they know all about hallucinogens. But truth be told, it's all about set and setting. If you prep, if you plan, right, the uh, available time should be there so that uh, there's enough time to enjoy the experience and then enough time to recover. It uh, essentially requires uh, people who are around, one of whom is willing to pick, play the sitter and not ingest, folks who you, you know, like and enjoy or who have, you know, committed to making sure the experience is positive, keeping the number relatively small, uh, and intimate, and then should you get uptight, that there are distractions available. So rather than going to the emergency room, uh, perhaps a Benadryl or an antihistamine and watching some cartoons to distract might be the first line of defense. But again, never do them. And uh, 
for the exam if you know which ones go in which category and what each of these are you're going to be in great shape thanks so much for tuning in